Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our special, very special event with former Culture Secretary Ed Vasey, Lord Vasey of Didcot. This event is the first of a series of very special and exclusive events, bringing closer knit groups together with niche interests, especially around Israel. Today's event will take the form of an interview followed by a Q&A, where you're encouraged to ask your questions directly to Lord Vasey. If, to let us know that you have a question, all you need to do is click on the raise hand button, which can be found at the bottom of the participants list. If you don't know where that is, move your mouse or tap your screen and the participants should be one of the options that come up below. We will take care of unmuting you. All you need to do is make sure your screen is on and that you accept the unmute request. Without further ado, I'd like to welcome Jonathan Lewis, who will both introduce our speaker and conduct our interview. Hello, everybody. Uh, it's my great pleasure to be uh, here this evening to interview um, Ed Vasey. We did try to get Piers Morgan and uh, Opera, but neither of them were available. So uh, you've got me to do this. Uh, Ed has had a glittering career, as was evident from the invitation to this event, but I'll just highlight a couple of things. Uh, he was appointed to the House of Lords in uh, 2020 and sits on the Communications and Media Committee. He was the Member of Parliament for Wantage between 2005 and 2019. Uh, and he served as the UK Government Culture and Digital Minister from 2010 to 2016. And in fact, he's the longest serving minister in that role. And I'm gonna ask him about that. Uh, he was appointed a Privy Councillor in 2016. And as digital minister, he was responsible for the rollout of the successful rural broadband program to more than 4 million homes. Uh, he introduced 4G and tax credits for film, television, and video games, which have helped to make the creative industries uh, the fastest growing part of uh, the UK economy. Um, I want to begin just with uh, asking Ed a few uh, personal questions about his career and then uh, as he's frequently on the radio and uh, as and TV as a as a pundit, I think it'll be interesting to get his views on a number of the uh, current issues of the day. Um, Ed, your um, I mean, I think your father was an academic and a journalist, but he was also made a life uh, peer. Uh, and I just wonder whether you were always destined for a political career and how it actually uh, came about. Uh, yeah, well, Jonathan, it's wonderful to be here for a start. So. Uh, Great to spend an evening with you and everyone else in the audience. And yes, uh, my uh, entire life was preordained pretty much from birth. I've not done anything uh, exceptional or different from uh, my birthright. So my father was an academic. He was an academic economist who uh, was the head of social sciences at Brunel University, but he was very closely aligned to the Labour Party and uh, he worked with the Labour Party for many, many years. And in 1976, Harold Wilson in his notorious lavender list uh, put my father in the House of Lords along with my godfather, George Weidenfeld. And uh, in fact, the lavender list came up for sale a couple of years ago and I was gonna try and buy it, but then the government said it was their property and it couldn't be sold. So my dad got into the House of Lords in the lavender list, but in uh, 1979, he became a conservative he had got to know Margaret Thatcher because he was a, an education economist. He got to know her when she was education secretary and he admired her more and more. And by the time she became leader of the opposition, he decided, and obviously Labour was in meltdown in the late 70s, he decided to join the Conservatives. And he died when I was quite young, when I was about 16. He died in 1984 uh, while a member of the House of Lords. And my mother was the art critic of first the Financial Times and then the Sunday Times. And so in my career, I've combined the two things that my parents did. My father was a sort of politician. He wasn't an elected politician, but he was a politician. And my mother was an art critic. So becoming culture minister sort of brought those two worlds together. And I spent a lot of time in my life, which I happen to like, by the way, uh, with lots of people saying, oh, I knew your father or I knew your mother. Uh, it's, it's been good uh, in that sense, uh, very fulfilling to kind of, in a sense, combine their two careers. But even in your youth, you never dallied with the Labour Party? No, by, I mean, again, it's quite 
boring, but uh, so my dad sent me to St Paul's. I'm now uh, I'm about to become president of the old Pauline Club. So if there are any old Pauline, I'm a member of well. what? Which I'm a member of as well. Well, exactly. So uh, we're going to be touching you up for a bit of money once you've bought enough Israel bonds. Um, so my dad, funny enough, Harold Wilson put him on the Public Schools Commission, which was a commission set up with the intention of abolishing public schools. And he met the then High Master of St Paul's and he completely fell in love with the school. And he sent his eldest son, my brother, to St Paul's. He actually tried to send me to Eton, but I refused. I didn't want to go, I didn't want to board. So I went to St Paul's as well, although everyone thinks that I went to Eton because they think I look a bit like David Cameron. Uh, and also just, uh, so uh, I was a pretty much a Tory as I became kind of politically sentient around the age of 10 or 11, you know, Margaret Thatcher had just become prime minister. And it is one of those things where nature, nurture, upbringing, you know, you're, you're around the breakfast table or the dinner table, people are talking politics, politicians are coming to your house for dinner. And, you know, I was drinking the Kool-Aid on Margaret Thatcher. So I was one of those kind of really revolting specimens, a sort of Tory boy at age 16. Uh, and I've stayed one ever since, although I think I've become slightly more left wing as I get older, which is a reverse process. So you got your... My friends keep getting richer and I keep getting poorer. But apart from that, it's fine. So you have made a peer, you still look very young to be a, a Lord, but uh, after 15 years as the MP for Wantage, I mean, how has your life changed ceasing to be an MP? Because I think that must have dominated your whole existence. And do you miss it or what do you miss about it? So I was quite pleased when I gave my mate, when I got made a peer, I was made a peer in this list that Boris Johnson uh, put up in uh, September last year. And uh, I was quite pleased in my maiden speech to say that there were quite a few newspaper articles that had said it was the worst list of peers since the Lavender list. So that was another good uh, bond with my father. Um, it got a lot of criticism that list partly because of people like Evgeny Lebdev being on it. But personally, I think there are some very good people who are on that list of peers. Uh, I was very pleased to leave the House of Commons. I sort of had enough. I've done 14 years and it is, it's a hard, it is a tough job being an MP. I'm not, it's a, it's a massive privilege, uh, but it does wear you down a bit. And obviously Brexit, I'm a Remainer. I was quite outspoken about Brexit. Um, so it was a tough four years uh, 2016 to 2020, uh, being in Parliament, going through Brexit. So I was pleased to get out, but I have to say, if I hadn't got into the House of Lords, I would have regretted leaving the House of Commons. I'm definitely a political junkie. I love politics, but the House of Lords is a fantastic alternative platform. It's very different. It's um, much more collegiate. It's much less partisan got a lot of very, very interesting people who really know what they're talking about, who've lived, uh, you know, had careers in a lot of the areas that politicians debate. So in that sense, it's, it, it, I prefer it now. I'm at the right time to be in the House of Lords. And it's also, it is quite nice being a young member of the House of Lords compared to everyone else. And so I, I will, let's, uh, let's crack straight into Brexit, because I think that is, um, that must have been a momentous thing for you. And when you actually were one of the 20 M 21 MPs who had the whip removed, I mean, was that a sort of calculated move? Were you expecting that? And, and I, I've got to ask whether you've changed your view on Brexit in the, you know, the world we're in now, as many people have, I think. So I, uh, I always say there's a little bit of Brexit inside me and I totally understood the sovereignty argument. You know, there is no doubt at all that the European Union is a political project and the big countries, France and Germany, want the United States of Europe. And I always said, for example, if they said that we had to join the single currency, I would prefer to leave the European Union. So I totally get that. What really drove me, I became much more of a Remainer after the vote because I hated the way the debate went, which was I felt it was hijacked by the hard Brexiteers and if you dare to say, actually, we could do this in a different way, we could be a member of the European Free Traders, you were called a traitor. And I just, that really, really annoyed me. Um, weirdly, when Boris became prime minister and started talking about no deal, I actually supported him. I thought if parliament can't make up its mind about Brexit, 
then let's have no deal. Uh, it's down to Parliament. And I only decided to vote against him when he clearly, when he did that prorogation of Parliament, which I thought was a real breach of faith, driven by Dominic Cummings. And that's when I, you know, I'd gone too far by then to go back. And to be honest, Jonathan, no, I didn't really expect him to remove the whip, but he did. Uh, and it was, it was pretty annoying, actually, considering the kind of things that Boris had voted against in the run up to becoming prime minister. You know, I voted for Theresa May's deal three times and all these Brexiteers voted against it with no consequence. I vote against Boris, I get chucked out. So I was pretty annoyed, but I was glad he let me back in. But you were, I mean, you were very associated with uh, David Cameron for most of your sort of uh, parliamentary career. How did you feel about the whole Brexit vote when it happened? And do you, do you, you know, do you sort of, you think it was a bit of a bad, badly handled at the time, the original vote? Well, you know, I feel very sorry for David Cameron. I think his reputation, I always thought that maybe he would uh, come out well from all this, but I do think on balance, his reputation has probably been trashed. I don't think he's taken very seriously as a political figure anymore, which is depressing because I actually thought the Cameron government was very, very effective. It wasn't particularly kind of inspiring uh, in the sense of people kind of wanting to die in a ditch for Cameronism but it was efficient and effective and it moved the country along. It was modernizing us. It was dealing with the deficit. You know, I thought, like everybody else, I thought we would win that vote and I thought we would win it for the most basic reason, which was people would want to stick with the status quo and not jump into the unknown. And it was a narrow vote. I mean, arguably, given the relentless propaganda against the European Union over 25 years, you would have thought Brexit might have won by uh, a bigger margin. And I think what no one had anticipated is a lot of people who'd never voted before. This was one issue they cared about, they were going to vote, and they made a big difference. And I'm not sure there was any argument that was going to actually win the vote with hindsight, because in the end, it was an emotional vote. And it's quite hard to get emotional about, you know, let's have free trade and no tariff barriers, as opposed to let's take back control. We're a sovereign and independent nation. Yeah. Okay, let's move on from Brexit. I mean, I can't, we can't uh, speak to you without looking and saying something about the pandemic. And now that you're outside the government, um, how do you think they're handling it? And uh, where do you think we're going to go from here? Have well, I mean, obviously they've... What? Have you booked your summer holiday yet? Yeah, we have actually, we've booked in Greece. Um, so we thought the Greeks would be the first to welcome us with open arms, and I think we could be proved right. Um, although I gather it, they're tearing it up in Israel, so maybe we should go to Israel. Um, yeah, I mean, they've had their ups and downs, haven't they? I mean, it's like trying to build the aeroplane as you, as you jump off the cliff, isn't it? Um, I think when this comes to be written, there'll be a lot of, while we, everyone who works in the NHS is amazing, I think there have to be questions to be asked about how many people caught the infection in hospital. Uh, clearly care homes, why more wasn't done. Even looking back a year ago, people knew the death rate in care homes was far too high. But I think some of the other stuff laid at their door, like you know the lack of PPE, every country in the world struggled with that. Uh, even test and trace, you know, tracing is very, very difficult. The testing, they got up and running. Uh, and obviously on the vaccination, it's been remarkable, really amazing. I mean, if we're going to build a statue to anyone at the end of this pandemic, it's got to be Kate Bingham. I mean, what she achieved is is formidable. And you saw that classic media arc of her being completely trashed and slagged off by the press until people realised what an amazing job she'd pulled off. I think, you know, look, the Tories are eight points ahead in the polls at the moment. I think... Um, you know, this will sound cynical, it's not meant to, but, you know, at the end of the day, I think this, the government will get, will have more people think it did a good job than a bad job. Because they're going to remember the vaccination. Yeah. Success, and, and I, I think that's true. Okay, next topic. Um, the last time I heard you on the radio, you, last week, you were talking about Megan. Yeah. Uh, Harry in the interview, and... Um, I think there's a, I've never, it's a long time since anything has generated as much coverage. And, but I, I wonder in terms of the royal family, what do you think about it? And 
whether you think it's really going to cause any lasting damage to the institution. So I slightly feel a, a plague on both their houses to a certain extent. I'm, a, I'm obviously a monarchist and I'm a great admirer of the Queen. I'm a great admirer of Prince Charles. I think he's done amazing stuff with his charities. Um, I think on balance, she shouldn't have done the interview. I mean, I watched the interview like everybody else. I thought she was, I thought Harry was incredibly impressive. Uh, but there's a lot of mud was thrown in that interview, which I think anyone sane would probably regret. I think the only lesson I took from that is that it is clearly there is something about that institution, the royal family, that finds it very, very, very hard to accommodate people who are different. And by different, I mean just have different kind of cultural background. She's American or Diana was different. Uh, and they just find it hard to be flexible. So if I was sitting at the heart of the royal family, I'd probably be chewing my hand off about how annoying that interview was, but I would reflect and say, there's something about this institution that can't accommodate people uh, who are a bit different. Kate Middleton played a blinder and has absolutely fitted in. She's pretty remarkable, but if people can't quite fit in, how do we flex this institution so we can accommodate them? Just, uh, just sort of the last thing on politics, I wanted to just say a little bit about the Labour Party. I mean, uh, Post uh, Jeremy Corbyn, uh, I'm still wondering where the Labour Party is headed, and, and particularly from a Jewish community point of view, where uh, anti Semitism, the word anti Semitism has appeared more in the press over the last few years associated with Labour than uh, I, I would ever want. Uh, I just wonder to what extent you think Labour is recovering from that and will be a, a serious force by the time of the next election. Look, politics can change on a sixpence. So I wouldn't write off Keir Starmer, but he's had a tough start. And clearly it's very hard to make an impression in the middle of a pandemic. Um, he's not doing as well as I thought he was gonna do, but he's repaired some of the damage that Jeremy Corbyn left uh, in during his tenure of the uh, Labour Party. But it does to a certain extent feel a bit like year zero for the Labour Party and they've been out of power for 10 years. You know, Keir Starmer almost feels a bit like William Hague, like starting the long march back to power. And at the moment, I can't see Keir Starmer becoming prime minister. Someone else coming down the track might become prime minister. And also he's too, the trouble with Keir Starmer is he's too calculating. He's not leading from his gut. So he's trying to hedge his bets on Brexit because he can't work out how to keep the Labour Party coalition of liberal metropolitan Remainers and more than Brexiteers uh, together and he doesn't quite know how to play the pandemic because he obviously wants to support the country and the government in doing the right thing and not be seen to make political capital. He's got to start listening to what he actually believes in and start trying to lead from the front but I think it's very difficult when you turn up at parliament and there's only going to be 20 people in the chamber of the house of commons. And the anti-semitism issue because it doesn't from, from the community point of view it doesn't seem to have gone away it's still rearing its head in different forms well there is this terrible history of anti-semitism and uh you know keir starmer is clearly obviously very far from the complete opposite of being anti-semitic and has done a lot i think to try and uh start the process of rooting it out but he's got to be absolutely ruthless and uncompromising and unfortunately he's still got the legacy of corbyn and he's still got quite a few labor mps who i suspect uh, are sympathetic to those views and he's got to be there's got to be a policy of complete zero uh, tolerance from him uh, to show that this isn't uh, going to be allowed to come back in any shape or form. Okay thanks for that. I'm just looking now there's a couple of other areas we'll cover before we wind up and I think or before we go out for questions to the audience but um, uh, obviously you had this incredible uh, period of time as uh, arts and culture minister and i wonder what you think about the state of the arts now and how it's going to recover and where you where would you if you were still minister where would you be deploying funds and how would you bring it back to life as we come out of the pandemic so look i mean uh, being the arts minister is the best job in government you uh have the absolute time of your life uh you go to amazing plays, you go to amazing museums, you go to amazing concerts, it's fantastic. And I remember, you know, Oliver Dowden, I wouldn't wish that job on my worst enemy now because you've got all the pain 
and absolutely none of the pleasure. Uh, I would have made the, uh, the government's had a big fund of sort of one and a half billion pounds to support the arts. I would have made it much simpler, probably bigger, just given all the big institutions the money they would have received in a normal year, handed it out as quickly as possible, made sure they supported as many freelancers as possible and just kept them, you know, a bit like a car in your garage, kept them ticking over until they're ready to play again. But if anything, it's shown how dependent we are on the arts. You know, we've all got through this pandemic in various ways, but mainly through Netflix and great drama, maybe watching National Theatre Live. Uh, we need the arts yeah. massively. And I would have just, I'm afraid, just thrown money at the money at the problem. Yeah, no, I do think people come to realise that quality of life, arts are absolutely fundamental. I think we've all realised that more in the situation we're in, uh, we're in now. Um, so I think your career now, you're spending quite a lot of time on technology and high tech and advisory roles. Uh, and I just wonder if you could tell us what sort of things you're involved in and where you think that's, that industry is headed. So I'm helping a lot of startups, giving them advice and uh, working with a few kind of tech advisory firms. So I had this strange uh, hybrid uh, role in government of looking after culture like museums and galleries, but also looking after the whole tech economy. And I always used to think that the arts are much more conservative than the world of tech. I mean, I love the world of tech because people say, how can I do things differently? I mean, we're doing this seminar online, thanks to a company that, you know, barely existed three years ago. Um, and there's been a bit of a hybrid between culture and tech during the pandemic, obviously, with people being able to watch plays online and that kind of thing. Uh, I think tech is really, really exciting. And it's not just the consumer tech you see in front of you. You know, Amazon became the fourth emergency service. We've all depended on Zoom, uh, but also the bat stuff, uh, the infrastructure, the broadband that supports it all. I think, you know, you started earlier on talking about Brexit. I think tech is our big, big opportunity. There's a report out today that says uh, we've uh, technology companies have raised more money in the first quarter of 2021 than they did in the whole of 2020. Uh, we're, we're easily up there with the US, importantly, with the US and China in terms of our tech economy. Uh, we've got much a massive opportunity now with Brexit to really power ahead. And the government has to really get behind, keep getting behind tech because uh, those are the jobs of the future. We shouldn't worry about people losing their jobs or whatever. They're going to create new and different jobs. And, uh, you know, if your children or grandchildren aren't spending eight hours playing video games, you know, you're not preparing them for the future. Of course, we're here under the auspices of Israel bonds and the Israel economy has also been uh, a powerhouse in terms of uh, technology. And that's what, for a tiny country, that's kept it going. I think you went uh, on a delegation in 2012. I just wonder to what extent you're in touch with Israeli high tech companies or um, how you see their future. So I went in uh, 2013 as the minister to visit Israel. Uh, I've been once before as a backbench MP. Uh, I went uh, when Matthew Gould was our ambassador there, who's now running the digital arm of the NHS. Um, I think he was amazingly the first Jewish ambassador, uh, British ambassador in Israel. Uh, I discovered my long lost family on a kibbutz and uh, it was a very emotional visit. And uh, but I also obviously went to see some tech companies. I do a tech podcast that comes out once a fortnight and I did one last year with this guy called Easy Vidra, who runs something called Reimagine Ventures. He's an Israeli based in London, backs a lot of Israeli tech companies. And we talk for an hour about Israel's success and, and what the secrets of its success are. And because I recorded it a year ago, I can't remember any of the reasons why Israel is successful, uh, except obviously that, you know, there's this famous book, Startup Nation. A lot of, uh, there's a lot of kind of, uh, I don't know whether it's really an urban myth or not, but a lot of linking of defense to tech. So the US has this thing called DARPA, which is the Applied Research Products Agency, which is all about the Ministry of Defense throwing lots of money at tech. And it has loads of spin-offs, a bit like space. And Israel is famous for, you know, um, national service, taking the brightest kids and putting them in the cyber security arm of the Israeli defense force and then they come out and create billion dollar companies <laughs> so uh there's a lot of that uh kind of synergy going on in israel 
um, that I think is the secret of the tech success. And also, obviously, you know, I don't think I don't think in the UK we pay enough attention to the Israeli tech economy because I keep saying to people, you know, Israel's four hours away. Uh, you can go and visit and invest in Israeli tech companies much more easily than you can in companies on the west coast of uh, of the US. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's great. I think um, I think now we ought to give uh, a few other people opportunity uh, to uh, ask some questions. So I'll uh, pass back to Joe Oza. But uh, thanks, thanks, thanks very much, Ed. I appreciate your uh, openness. Thanks. Thank you, Jonathan, and uh, thank you, Lord Vasey. Um, some of the stories that you've just told us have been really incredible to listen to. Um, we're now moving on to the Q&A portion of the event. Please remember to raise your hand with the button at the bottom of the participants list and we'll call on you in order to ask your question. Just accept the unmute request and make sure your video is on and we'll do the rest. And the first question is from Samantha Harvey. Thank you, your Lord. It's a great pleasure to to welcome you today. And uh, I want to say big thank you to Joe and Jessica. Can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah, we yes. can hear you. Okay, because so many interesting sessions since the lockdown started to keep us entertained and keep us in contact. And thank you so much, amazing. So I just want to very quickly ask, uh, it is a controversial question, but your Lord, I think you're the only one could give us and some, share some light for us. And, and first and foremost, thank you so much for booking your holiday because I have a few travel agencies on High Street. So music to ears that you're brave enough, but of course, hopefully it, everything will be safe for you. And uh, I will not asking any question about how the government has or hasn't put specific sectors help for, for our industry. That's a different question for a different date. But I'm also a conservative counselor in Wakefield. And I'm a Jew, I'm proud because I chose to be a Jewish, to, to be Jewish because um, the rabbi I went to, uh, I did the cycling in Israel three, four years ago. And uh, also Dr. Rabbi, he said, okay, how long does it take you to be converted? And they were thinking about a week or two. And I said, no, four years, <laughs> four years for a reformed you know, uh, shoe. It's not easy, but I wanted to say this, the elephant in the room is the Uyghur in China. So as a Jew, and uh, when I see those image with men shaven heads piled up to the trains you know, from the platform, it does send some chill down my spine. But I have asked so many experts and I know that Holocaust is not everything can compare to Holocaust. You know, some people telling me that because some chickens in the farm are, are being raised in a very contained environment. So that's Holocaust of uh, chicken. So I think we want to make sure that how are we going to be able to label this genocide? This, this you know, I'm not a mouthpiece for Beijing, but I think we need to know for certain what is what, which is what, because uh, there is a big issue with China. How are we going to trying to work with China and also the foreign policies have been changed today by Johnson to, to shift our sort of a focus to the Far East, to the Indochina Pacific area. And it's going to be a long term issue for us to come back to. I, I know that uh, we are conservative have a some hard, hard, you know, right wing again. The same people actually argue the most about Brexit, actually wanted to cut all the tie with China. So what's your view, your, your lordship? Thank you so much. So you're, you're originally Chinese, Sam. So you're Chinese, Jewish, and a conservative councillor in Wakefield in Yorkshire. That is amazing. Uh, what a combination. I think Wakefield is now a conservative seat, which is part of the red wall, uh, as it were, no pun intended, of uh, Boris Johnson. But um, I think the China issue is obviously very, very difficult. I think what is happening with the Uyghurs is appalling, and uh, I hesitate, you know, whether one should use the word uh, genocide, but certainly it's forced uh, uh, relocation, uh, forced uh, movement of uh, millions of people, uh, imprisonment of millions of people. Uh, it's an appalling, uh, it's, a, it's probably the world's largest human rights abuse going on at the moment, and uh, the world is right to condemn it. And similarly, obviously, uh, what is happening in Hong Kong in terms of the repression of people's uh, rights. But you are right as well. You know, we live in the world, uh, in a world where we have to deal with 
countries and governments that aren't necessarily doing the things that we approve of. And we work with countries like Saudi Arabia, for example. Uh, and we do that on the basis of uh, having to live in this world and having to find areas of cooperation. Uh, but clearly, you know, the government is pivoting its um, foreign policy and its defense strategy towards Asia Pacific. That's where all the economic growth is going to come from. And that's where potentially some of our security threats will now come from as China asserts itself in that region. So uh, I, uh, I, I, I don't uh, subscribe necessarily to, to the view of some people like Tom Tugendhat, who, who, who take the view that everything from China is bad. And I think, you know, this phone was made in China. You, you can't live your life. You cannot purge yourself, as it were, of everything that's Chinese. And we should also remember that governments are different from people. And China has an incredible culture stretching back many thousands of years. And China's place in the world is in many respects a return to normal service as it existed before the 19th century. So I tend to feel that there is an element sometimes, racism is probably the wrong word, but there is an element in how we treat China and how we comment on China which is profoundly patronizing to a great country and a great people. Thank you. Uh, the next question is from Ronald, Ronald Kohn. Uh, thanks everybody for organizing and uh, thanks uh, Lord Vasey for the um, presentation. So two quick questions that are quite different. So number one, I am in uh, the technology field uh, and as you stated, uh, the, the amount of investment and the rapid pace uh, keeps increasing. But also, and I've been based here in London for the last uh, eight years. So as a technologist, what can we do so that British firms remain competitive in this ultra competitive world that we live in in uh, technology? So that's uh, question number one. And then question number two, which is actually a funny story. Um, my father graduated from high school in New York in 1949 with your uncle, Peter Stansky. And uh, what is the connection of him specializing at Stanford in modern British history and your uh, mom, uh, Lady Vasey, coming over to the um, UK? And as a side note, when my father passed away in 2018, uh, she somehow got a hold of me. Uh, to wish uh, good uh, uh, goodwill for my father's passing. Thank you. Uh, well, that's an amazing uh, story, Ronald, and I hope uh, I go and, uh, I mean, I don't want to, obviously this is a private meeting, so if I'm going to admit to illegal activity now, but I do go and see my mother every day. Uh, my mother is a great Jewish mother, and um, uh, we spend an hour shooting the breeze every day uh, or rather I sit next to her looking at my phone and she complains and I revert to being 15. So I love that story. And I'm quite, even though my uncle lives in San Francisco, we're quite close. So I can't wait to tell him that we met. And uh, it all, it's all linked. So basically my uncle, uh, you know, went to uh, Yale, uh, was a historian, wanted to be an academic, became interested in British history, came over to Cambridge. Uh, he met my father, introduced my father to my mother. Uh, they didn't kind of have, uh, they didn't date or anything. They just knew each other. Uh, and my father was, you know, slightly odd, I guess, but he, he went over to New York to the UN, met my mother again. And then when he left New York, having not dated my mother, he just wrote to her and said, I think we should get married. And my mother said, yes, okay. So at age 24, she went over to London and married my father. And uh, the rest is kind of history. Although my father, as I say, died very young. But my mother, you know, I really value my uh, Jewish heritage. My grandfather, Lyman Stansky, um, grew up in a, as one of eight children in a tenement in the Lower East Side. His father was a tailor. My uncle's, my grandfather's first language was Yiddish. Uh, he was the first in his family to go to university. He, no white shoe firm in New York would employ him because he was Jewish. He became a sole practitioner. He lived till he was 94. Uh, my cousin, uh, Jeffrey Cagle, 
is now the world's most famous Jewish yogic chanter called Krishna Das. And uh, I have a crazy family in New York and a crazy family in Austin, Texas. Uh, my Jewish cousin was the first one to have a gay marriage in Texas. She got sued by the Republican Attorney General. Uh, she was the first gay appointment by President Clinton, I think, as the Energy Commissioner. And so it goes on. So I have this rich, rich heritage over in the US, which is a hell of a lot more interesting than talking about how to keep tech competitive. <laughs> so I can't wait to tell my mum that we met. This is very exciting. Thank you. Um, next question is from Chris. Chris. Hello. Um, thank you very much, Lord Basie, for coming to, and speaking to us tonight. Uh, I've got a question relating to the UN, which has proved to be incredibly anti-Semitic over the years, UNRWA and, and, and uh, the, the general tone of the voting against, against Israel. Um, do you think that the British government is doing sufficient to support Israel at the UN and, and uh, at, the, meet, at the, the voting there? Uh, so I'm not across uh, the detail of how the British government is behaving, but I suspect the answer is probably not. Uh, I don't think the uh, Foreign Office is necessarily very supportive of uh, Israel. It's traditionally been seen as very uh, pro the Arab states. I have to say, I think uh, what is happening in the foreign policy in terms of Israel in the last couple of years has been fascinating to watch and very, very encouraging. And fingers crossed that the Effectively, the anti-Iran alliance of Gulf states now will work uh, together with Israel going forward. I mean, clearly, this government at the moment has very many strong supporters of Israel, from Michael Gove downwards, as it were. And the Conservative Friends of Israel are an extraordinarily strong organization uh, who do an amazing work in outreach with conservative politicians. So. Uh, I don't know enough about Dominic Raab or what his views are, um, but you always have, I suspect, some difficulty with the Foreign Office, which uh, tends to be, uh, would like to see itself as very even handed on these issues. But again, lots of change has happened in the past. I mean, I referenced Matthew Gould earlier as the first Jewish ambassador to Israel from the UK. You know, he, he was a step change and going back to Ronald's question, he set up the UK Israel Tech Hub, for example. Uh, so I think that you are getting, uh, Israel's getting a, a better, has got a better and stronger voice in the time that I've been in frontline politics, in British politics. Thank you. The next uh, question will be from Nazar Lodi. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, thanks very much, first of all, for sending me an invitation and allowing me to join uh, to hear what a wonderful uh, interview from this young lord. Uh, the question is, uh, let me tell you a little bit about myself. I was born in Pakistan. I come into this country when Israel, the first Israel Arab war was going on. And the first thing I used to do, listening to the radio and the news, what was happening. I didn't have a television. I didn't have a heater in my room. So I used to just climb under the blanket and listen that what happened and, and uh, admire. I'm not saying here, that's my view as curriculum. Admire the Israel state surrounded with so many, I put in inverted commas, friends around Israel and still survived where your threat every day was going to happen. And uh, I am a, I was a local councillor in Slough, Chamber of Commerce member, Vice President of Chamber of Commerce. And uh, my interest and question today is we, I would like to work to do something in this country where we can do business with the Pakistani community here, Israel to start with, and then develop the relation is maybe far fit israel and pakistan 
I always believed Pakistan should recognize Israel. Time will come, but I want to have a little platform where you can start working now. I made a number of attempts without any success, but now I'm talking to a few friends and I want to do. What's your view and you, how you can help, Lord? So where Israel and Pakistan have a good relation and we can do something from this country. Thank you. Well, I think, uh, I think, Nazar, that's an amazing uh, offer and uh, obviously a great opportunity. I do think that countries trading together is often the way forward uh, to uh, ensure uh, good relations, although that may not apply to Iran. Uh, but certainly, for example, I've never understood why <clears throat> America persists with its blockade of Cuba when it could probably topple the communist regime in Cuba in a year by just trading with them normally. And I think what is fascinating to learn about the recent developments in terms of Israel's relationship with the Gulf states is the incredible boom in tourism. Apparently, uh, hundreds of thousands of Israeli citizens have gone to go on holiday in Dubai. And so suddenly you get the feeling, I mean, it may not be the case because Middle East politics is so complicated, but you get the feeling that there's kind of no going back from that. You know, once, once the tourism happens and the cultural exchange effectively happens, there's no going back. It's a bit like the border between Ireland and Northern Ireland. You, you, apart from obviously the complications with Brexit, once that you have an open border there, you feel that there can be no return to kind of terrorism, but who knows? I'm not saying never, but it makes a big, big difference. So. You know, I think cultural exchanges between Pakistan and Israel should not be underestimated. People often think they're frivolous and pointless, but the more cultural exchanges you can have, uh, you know, watching each other's films or plays or hearing each other's music uh, and trade and facilitating trade and maybe meetings between the Pakistani community here and the Israeli community here would be amazing. I mean, you are here as part of this uh, evening. So clearly those links exist. So let's carry on pursuing them. And again, I mentioned earlier how many, how what a, an amazing job the Conservative Friends of Israel does. There are plenty, obviously, of <clears throat> highly successful Pakistani conservatives. I came into the Lords with one, Safran Nazar, uh, who I'm sure would want to engage. So there are Pakistani peers and Jewish peers who I'm sure could work together, for example, <clears throat> to create exactly the kind of dialogue uh, you've talked so inspiringly about tonight. Thank you. And Nazar, I will, um, after this event, I will send you details of the Asian Jewish Business Network, as if you, if that's something that you want to explore. Um, see, Joe's then, already all over it. All yeah, over amazing. it. <laughs> all, all over it. Next question we have is from Miriam Wilcox. Miriam, thank you. Thank you. Good evening, Lord Vasey. Um, I just want to um, ask you a question and thank you very much for your talk. Um, I, I find it very interesting that you've been on both sides of the fence, as it were, um, Labour and Conservative. So I was just wondering um, what the cabinet meetings were like um, under the different prime ministers um, that you served under. And I wondered if you preferred one to the other. Well, it was my father that was on both sides of the fence, <clears throat> having been Labour and Conservative. And he was never an MP and he didn't serve in any cabinet. And I didn't serve in the cabinet, but I served as a senior minister. But uh, I did serve with three different uh, prime ministers. My favourite was David Cameron because he gave me my dream job. My least favourite was Theresa May because she sacked me. And my uh, in between was Boris, who uh, sacked me and then gave me a job. So uh, I do like Boris. He's got an amazing uh, charisma and personality. But I do think still that David Cameron was a very, very fine prime minister. Funnily enough, <clears throat> Brexit and Remain make strange bedfellows. So I've become quite friendly with Tony Blair. And I don't know whether this is a controversial thing to say to this audience, but I have tremendous admiration for Tony Blair as a politician. I think he's a very, very impressive politician. And I think, again, this sounds a bit crude to say this, uh, but he's had a good war in terms of the pandemic. Uh, he's made some very important contributions to the deb debate. So uh, I also uh, was a Tory candidate under John Major. 
And I was lucky enough to meet Margaret Thatcher because she was obviously a friend of my father's. And uh, if I had to pick any prime minister over the last 30 or 40 years, Margaret Thatcher would still be my favorite. Great. Um, next question is from Morgan Oriera. Uh, Lord Daisy, um, thank you. So nice to hear from you. Um, uh, again, my name is Morgan Urioha. Um, I was born in a place called Our Mama um, uh, in what I call the Biafra Kingdom, uh, which is or used to be well, part of Nigeria as, as it is. Uh, Lord Vesey, my question actually is because um, I found your talk very interesting, especially in the area of. Uh, uh, the tech um, advisory. I myself, I am an engineer and uh, I've had good experience in that area. So I would be a lot more interested in knowing how perhaps I can uh, uh, fit in, you know, um, in delivery of uh, advisory, um, see how I can partner with you or partner with firms, maybe through you and uh, see how we can expand from that area and also explore the opportunities for trade and industry. As a matter of fact, I am a system des uh, designer, um, you know, quite willing to explore opportunities for trade and uh, areas of uh, partnership, much more with you. Hmm? And even learn from you as well. I mean, I, I see a lot of experience from you I, 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 that I would actually want to tap from. Hmm? Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Morgan. I'm not sure there's anything I could teach you. Um, and I think uh, it's interesting you come from Nigeria because uh, obviously Nigeria is uh, one of the youngest countries on earth in terms of its population and um, one of the most exciting and fastest growing countries on earth. Uh, it has an incredible, vibrant, creative cultural scene, amazing music scene. And I think Nigeria is gonna dominate the world. And I think the key to tech advisory is to find your niche. And my niche is obviously that I understand government and how it works and I can, I know a lot of people. So a startup will come to me and say, we would love to meet X, Y, or Z and offer our product. And so I can open a door for them. I think what you can do, Morgan, is give huge opportunities to tech companies in the UK to explore this incredible market in Africa. And I think the key about Africa and tech is that Africa has kind of, uh, leapt forward. For example, you know, Africa went straight to mobile, if you like, uh, straight to mobile payments. There are a lot of tech services in Africa that are much more embedded in the consumer economy than they are in the UK because they didn't have the legacy systems we had. So I think there are massive opportunities for you to become the UK Nigerian tech envoy. Thank you, Morgan. Thank you. And our last question is going to come from Margaret Bradley. Hello. Um, thank you very much, Lord Vesey, for your sharing your experience and your story with us. And thank you for um, the Israel bonds for setting this all up. That's been so interesting. Um, I'm afraid I'm, I'm going back to Brexit. <clears throat> um, and You've said very good things, very um, appreciative things about the House of Commons and the House of Lords and our form of government. Um, but don't you agree that the whole European plan or the whole European direction of travel is to unity, ever closer union? which in the end will be a United States of Europe with um, different countries' laws completely overpowered by um, group decisions in Brussels or um, Berlin um, or wherever. Um, and so what, where would you have seen your place if eventually that happened? Would you still see yourself in the House of Commons or the House of Lords, or would you have seen yourself as a Euro MP? Well, it's a very good question, Margaret. I think you uh, hit it on the head. So 
I said earlier that there's a bit of Brexit inside me, which is I don't want a United States of Europe <clears throat> and I would have fought against it. And I think maybe in some ways there's a perfectly legitimate argument to say we got off the train traveling at 30 miles an hour and we've broken our ankle, but it's a hell of a lot better than getting off the train at 100 miles an hour and cracking our head open. So I think it's going to be painful Brexit. Uh, I think we will find over the years that we will get closer to Europe in the way, say, that Norway or Switzerland are. <clears throat> we will take the stuff that we like from Europe and even some of the stuff that we say we don't like, like the free movement of people, because it's in our economic interest to do. But we will have avoided, as previous prime ministers avoided by not taking us into the euro, we will have avoided becoming part of what you correctly identify as the direction of travel to the United States of Europe. And Europe itself has to be very careful, or the European Union has to be very careful, because it's not just the British that don't want a United States of Europe. And if they go too far and too fast, as they did with the Euro, which almost broke up the European Union and destroyed many of the Southern economies, if they go too far and too fast, they will throw out the baby with the bathwater. There's a lot to be said about the European Union in terms of the incredible way it created this single uh, economy where we could trade so freely. But there is also the fact that there is an inexorable law of political physics that every time you create a political institution, whether it's the Scottish Parliament or the European Parliament, they will try and grab more and more power to themselves. And that's uh, your very shrewd point uh, made, Margaret. Thank you. Um, look, we're going to ask one more question because Shane has uh, kindly put his hand up. Um, so Shane, take it away. Thank you, Lord Vasey. It's a very quick question. Uh, you started telling us tonight about predestiny. Um, it's evident in your transition in, in every subject you've spoken about tonight, and it's evident in your transition from culture secretary into a te tech role. Um, simply, what have you learned from predestiny? And can you tell us anything else uh, personally or uh, across? Will it bring you back into Parliament, for example? Well, I mean, I said I said it slightly tongue in cheek, but I think there's a serious point here, which is um, I don't think I've been very brave in my life. And I admire I much more admire people who have been brave and uh, taken decisions. Um, where they're doing something completely different. The guy I shared a room with when I started my career, I, I shared a room in a, a Conservative Party headquarters. Uh, he had come over, he was the son of Hungarian immigrants, and uh, he had come over to uh, the UK with them as refugees. And he'd gone to a public school, but on a full scholarship and got himself to Oxford. And um, the only reason he was sitting in the room with me was he. Uh, he, he took a summer job working at, at an insurance office. It was just after the great storm in 87, and they were, had to hire people to process all the claims. And at home, he watched, this ad, uh, he watched a party political broadcast by the Conservative Party. And he thought, I think I'm probably a Conservative because, you know, the only reason I'm here is because of the Communists. And he rang the number at the bottom of the, uh, at the end of the, broadcast and he got himself a summer job working for the Conservative Party and he became a very senior figure in the Conservative Party. He became our sort of chief election strategist. And I, I always tell that story about Steve because, you know, I think that's a kind of remarkable journey. I have not had a remarkable journey. I've had a completely safe, uh, straightforward journey. Um, the only thing I've learned, because I did become a lawyer briefly and I became a lawyer for all the wrong reasons, which is I thought it was the right thing to do. Sorry, apologies to Jonathan. Uh, I should have been a solicitor. I became a barrister. My, the only thing I've learned and the only thing I would say to my kids is, um, and indeed to other parents, is uh, follow your passion. So if my kids come to me and say, I want to do X, and it, I will not say, what do you mean? You should be a doctor or a lawyer. I'll say, do it. Because if you care about it, uh, you will succeed at it and you'll be happy. And I think also a lot of the entrepreneurs I meet they're not people who uh, set out to say, I want to be a multimillionaire. They set out because they're passionate about something. Often they're passionate just about being their own boss. So for me, the 
the two qualities needed for success in life are passion and confidence. That will sort out your destiny. Thank you so very, very much, Lord Vasey. Um, before we closed it for the evening, it would be remiss for me to not thank you for um, for getting convincing Lucasfilm to uh, film Star Wars in the UK, being a big Star Wars fan. Um, and and just uh, just quickly ask, what was that like? That. So this is a great story to end on. It sums up everything really about Britain and the US. So. Uh, we wanted to get Star Wars filmed in the UK. And to do that, you basically have to, bribe is a strong word, but you have to lay out the red carpet. You know, we have a film tax credit, but there were other things that Lucasfilm wanted, uh, potentially specific grants, which we were prepared to give them. Now we arranged to meet uh, a woman called Kathy Kennedy, who's the most important woman in Hollywood. She was Steven Spielberg's right-hand person before she took over Lucas Films on Saturday morning at number 10 Downing Street with the Chancellor of the Exchequer. And I turned up at number 10 Downing Street half an hour early and I walked in and I knocked on the famous black door and it was opened by a grumpy bloke, uh, a security guard. And I said, I'm here for a meeting with the Chancellor of the Exchequer. The entire building was deserted. And I said, does he have any guests waiting for him? And the bloke said, I've no idea. I wandered around the building on my own for about 10 minutes. I could have staged a coup. And then I came back and I said, I can't find where the meeting is, but can I just check, is there anyone here to meet the Chancellor of the Exchequer? And he said, well, there are some people in that van outside. And the three most important people in Hollywood who were gonna spend about a billion quid in the UK have been told by this bloke to wait in the van. So we eventually got them out of the van, we got them into the meeting and we did the deal. But that is so British. And I've always said, it's a terrible thing to say, but I've always said the first thing I would do if I became prime minister is I'd hire the maitre d' of the Ivy. And you know this big row that Boris has had about doing up Downing Street. I mean, Downing Street is falling apart. It's pathetic. It's this country's front door. And when you walk through it, you should be greeted like a long lost friend. Nothing is too much trouble. Anyway, we got them in and the punchline to the story, I can tell you want to end this uh, long talk, but the punchline to the story is as a thank you, at the end of the first of the new films, I can never remember what it's called, they put me and George Osborne, they put a thank you to us at the end of the credits. Amazing. And George and I were at the premiere of this movie and George Osborne stood there waiting to see his name on the credits and the trouble is the credits go on for about 15 minutes <laughs> and he's standing there literally the entire cinema it's a 2000 seater cinema the entire cinema is empty and it's just me and george staring at the screen with our phones ready to photograph the moment and we're the last names on the entire credit fantastic that is amazing. Thank you so very much um, for giving us an hour of your time for exploring every every uh, subject under the sun. Um, to everyone here, thank you also for joining us. Um, next Thursday, Israel Bonds has our 70th birthday gala event, which you're all invited to join for. Um, email will go out shortly uh, in about half an hour or so with all the details uh, and registration and if you're not on our mailing list please do drop me a line drop me an email and uh, get on it so that we can send you the information thank you everyone thank you lord vasey thank you jonathan good evening good night